streamer mode. Enable streamer mode. Do we want that disabled? I think you want it enabled, don't you? That was my assumption. All right, well, we should be going live. Now we, we're live. Okay, let's push that recording button. All right, chat. If anybody is hanging out watching track one, feel free to uh, start talking in the track one channel on Discord. You're also welcome to start giving us some uh, questions over in the track one live QA channel. In the meantime, let's uh, introduce our um, guests for right now. Uh, we have Olek and we have Poon Tester, or I'm sure you two will come up with better ways to explain how you pronounce your names. But uh, thank you very much for joining us today. Uh, give us the, uh, the name of the talk that you did, and we'll start uh, asking you some silly questions about it. Okay, yeah, so the, the talk was um, Room for Escape, scribbling, scribbling Outside the Lines of Template Security. Um, a talk around content management systems and in particular the template engines used in these systems and how we were able to break out of the uh, sandboxes of mitigation that they put in place in order to prevent arbitrary. If you have any questions about the talk or anything else, maybe we can help you. Just feel free to ask, to ask anything. How do you like your, uh, your handle pronounced? Um, I pronounce it Pontester. Pontester. I don't know if that's a better. Yeah. yeah I think that we I'm just uh, entered into one of the mighty converse, uh, you know, the arguments in the hacker world if it's Pwn or Poon. So uh, we're going to go with Pwn because that sounds a little bit better. <laughs> so, uh, Oleg, go ahead and give your, uh, give your little bit of an intro. About myself? Yeah, we'll click over to you. I'm a security researcher for already more than 10 years and uh, working for Macrofocus Spotify. And uh, I'm happy to, to have chance to work with Spontester for a couple of years already. And it's our fourth uh, shared research. And I'm happy with these results and I'll hope to get something similar in the next years. Absolutely. Before I, I will retire. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, so that's a good segue, actually, to talk uh, while we're waiting for people to come up with some good questions for you. Uh, tell us a little bit about some of the, uh, th this is definitely not your first talk here at DEF CON. So um, just briefly give us some background on where you came from and um, what the earlier talks were so that people know how to reach back and find you in the archives. And then maybe touch on um, how does this one feel different than the other talks that you've done? Okay, um, so I think the first one that we did together was um, Friday the 13th, uh, Jason Attacks. That was no, actually around... it was, uh, sorry, it was GNDI Injections. Uh, it was the first one. Did we present just... that at DEF CON or just at Black Hat? Just at Black Hat, you're right. Ooh. So the, the, the first one that we presented together was the JNDI injection. I think the, the full title was something like uh, JNDI injection. Um, uh, how, how was that? Like, Dreamland to RC something. <laughs> yeah, no, like a trip into RC. I don't know. I don't remember the title anymore. <laughs> that was around uh, JNDI injection in in Java world. Java, uh, ecosystems, which was then used for many of the DCRization gadgets. Uh, so that was a, a good one. And then before that one, I presented at DEF CON uh, one with Dennis Cruz and Eif Kang mm -hmm. that was called Resting in Your Laurels Will will Get You Pwned or Pwned. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, yeah, that was a nice one. So the, the first one that we did together was uh, this about JNDI uh, injection attacks. Then the one, the first one that when we presented at uh, DEF CON and we had to drink our shots as new speakers was um, this one about uh, JSON attacks, JSON visualization attacks. 
Gotcha. And then last year we presented um, single sign-on words, SSO words, um, the token menace, where we presented a, an attack on, on SAML uh, implementation in Microsoft stacks. Uh, that was a flow in, in .NET framework. And now this year we repeat again as a team with, with this one. <laughs> Excellent. And we really appreciate that you both came out to do that. So um, you two did, as we're waiting for people to jump in with more questions, you did present me with one that I'm going to sneakily slide in here as if somebody else asked it. The vulnerabilities that you disclose all seem to require that the attacker have user level access to the system. Is that true? Is that a hurdle for most? Oh, see, now I'm, now I'm talking over you. So your turn, you go. Okay, I think it's mostly true. It still depends on applications, on configuration, on specific configuration. But to be able to perform such attacks, uh, attackers should be able to create or at least modify some template. And in most cases, it's at least user level uh, account. For SharePoint, it's just user level account. It's, it's default configuration and just user level account. Any user in, in default configuration can, can do this. For uh, other applications, it still depends. Sometimes it's just uh, user level. Sometimes you need to be like writer and, or some other roles, more, more, more powerful roles, uh, sometimes even administrator. Uh, so uh, uh, one requirement for our attack, attacker should be able to, 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 to manage uh, these templates or ISPX pages in case of uh, SharePoint. Okay, so maybe not, uh, the, the minimum is just they have to be able to, to deal with the SharePoint side. They have to be able to control that, but it's not necessarily that. Yeah. No. So for so, SharePoint so case. Assumption... Yeah. Go yeah. ahead, Alex. So for SharePoint, so, it's a bit simpler. Any user can, can, can have access to own private uh, site and can manage it. It's your, your, your site. And you can uh, use this at least this site for uh, performing attacks. For other uh, applications, yes, it, it depends on configuration, depends on the permission for specific projects, for specific uh, sub, sub, sub uh, sites and other things. Okay. Mm -hmm. so, so I was going to add that our assumption in this talk is that we were able, or the attacker were able to control the, the templates, uh, right? So. Um, and then our research re research was around breaking outside of those sandboxes. So in a similar way that um, we may present something around breaking mitigations for uh, buffer overflows, but our research was not how to find those buffer overflows in, in the first place. So okay. um, I'm saying that because apart from being able to um, control the, te the contents of the template, um, different vectors may include things like server-side template injection or maybe for example um, if there is a cross-site scripting vulnerability in that page you can use that to fool um, a victim into submit a malicious template in your behalf or maybe uh, there is a, cr a cross-site request for JD that you can abuse in order to manipulate or modify their template content so we didn't really care about how you were able to get access to the content. It may be because you have access to, like uh, Alexander explained, is the, the normal case, for example, in things like SharePoint or a, a wiki, for example, where you can edit your own articles and things like that. But maybe in other systems, some of the ones that we reported, like Office, for example, they were vulnerable to server-side template injection. And, and for example, in some cases, we were able to uh, request trial accounts in content management systems that were deployed on, on the cloud, like in server, uh, software as a service architectures. And with those trial accounts, we were able uh, we were able to phone those servers and compromise the underlying servers. So in a big was, way, um, you've um, given us another uh, step in our chain, another tool to escalate how much damage we can do once we have a foothold. Yeah, exactly. Excellent. What, what level of access were you using to get that remote remote code execution? Were you just a regular user and able to escalate that far? So in some cases, like Alexander explained for SharePoint, 
just having um, an account in SharePoint, like a regular user account, uh, allows you to create your own site and then you can control the, the template or the ASPX page in this case for SharePoint. And then you can use that to get remote code execution on the admin relations uh, server. In other cases like XWiki, just a regular user as well, other systems like, for example, Atlassian Confluence, you were required to be administrator in order to uh, edit a template. So in those systems, either you are an administrator, so it's kind of more like an insider attack, or maybe those systems are vulnerable, as I, as I explained before, you find a cross-site scripting vulnerability and you can escalate from cross-site scripting to remote code execution by being able to fool the, the victim in to submit or modify a template on your behalf. Okay, so um, can you give us a little bit of background on how you came upon this type of research? What was your entry point into doing this attack? It's not easy to answer. It's just usual when you have some target that uh, allows you something and you think, wow, it's a lot of things for, for, for attackers. And it start game. And uh, you try to, to, to use one thing to bypass something to, to for example, SharePoint, it allows you to, to, to upload ASPX pages. So you, you, you first thing, uh, why we cannot put only a code there and uh, execute code there? No, we cannot. Why we cannot? And game starts. Uh, <laughs> Uh, and it's not only SharePoint. There are a lot of such uh, such server or services that allows you to, to 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 define some templates for for dynamic content. And you actually you can access getters. You can access some methods. You can access uh, some objects. Uh, why we cannot abuse them? Well, let's try. Well, let's see what we can do. What we can do further with it, all this stuff. And it start our our research, investigation, and uh, at the end, we have such results. You uh, chained it down. Oh, I, I'm on mute. So you pushed it down that direction. That makes sense. Um, and it, I'm assuming then we're kind of talking to a general mindset of when you're doing your normal day-to-day -day work, you find something that's a little funny and you uh, just can't let it go. I mean, this is a... Uh, greater question about what does it take to be a hacker. It's always nice to hear people who are out there in the world doing these presentations, doing this research, talk to the rest of us who are uh, getting our feet wet in the world of web application security or whatever the, the, the uh, whatever your niche is. You know, how do the rest of you folks who are getting all of the success, doing these cool presentations and research, how do you approach these? How do you know when you have something cool? So in my case, and, and continuing uh, Alexander's uh, response, I guess that I started this research because uh, Oleg came to me and said like, okay, I found these four different ways of breaking the SharePoint safe mode. Uh, at that for that time, time. Found, <laughs> we found uh, a found lot of more. <laughs> so he said, like, maybe if, if we also look at the Java side, we get something interesting that can be interesting, like a full research, uh, like something that is more self-contained somehow. And then uh, he told me, like, can you take a look at some of the like most popular engines in, in Java? And when I was there, I was like, okay, let's see. Uh, it's before I started looking at in the implementation of those engines and, and, and do like code review and things like that, it was like, okay, I'm here, I get access. I assume that I get access to a template. What can I do now? Uh, what objects are available? So I started looking and inspecting the, the uh, template context by uh, debugging the applications and setting some, some breakpoints. And then I was surprised that um, I was able to access thousands of objects that were non-intentionally uh, exposed. They were like, they're indirectly exposed by other objects. And with that big um, amount uh, attack surface, it was like, this is going to be easy to find something that I can uh, be used to get remote code execution. That was the case. And then as a second part of the research, uh, we started looking at the implementation of those um, libraries. And then we, fo we found some um, specific flaws in the implementation the way they were checking block lists, for example, 
or gaps on those block lists or um, things like that that I explained in the talk. That's that was that was your entry. You uh, all of a sudden you're like I have something, and then you spent a significant amount of time check, testing the boundaries of the thing that you had until you worked your way towards where we are now. That's uh, that makes sense. It's always good to hear mm -hmm. hear from you folks. Kind of where you're coming from on that. So um, so I saw that there's a few different content management systems that you looked at, and I imagine at some point you just kind of run out of time to keep checking things. Do you think that there are still more out there that people could follow your techniques and do the same kind of thing to, to, to find vulnerabilities? Is that also going to be an area that you plan to continue to research or are you guys kind of done with this one? I definitely there should be a lot of products. Uh, we, we think there is there a lot of products. Uh, as, as you mentioned, there are just a couple of them are uh, under our focus and actually uh, for example if you're talking about sharepoint it is not automated approach it's just manual and just to find some patterns and we try to to to, to show this pattern in our presentation uh, and i believe there's still a lot of thing to, to to look for in sharepoint in specifically and about uh, other content even not content management system uh, in any other system like uh, uh, it may be a, a email uh, servers if you if you can uh, define a, a template for then then and content for some uh, auto creation emails it can be a starting point for your research as well so uh, our purpose of our research our presentation just show our our uh, um, our patterns our approaches and say hey guys we, we use this and we got such results like 30 uh, new vulnerabilities uh, you can use the same it's not only for offensive side it's 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 for defensive as well uh, guys if you are uh, developing something that um, go on in this uh, bucket you need to to look on on, on these areas uh, to, to to check this uh, because you you can see what what what, what can happen um, so of course anybody welcome to to, to continue on this research uh, about myself i'm not sure <laughs> i need to have some rest vacation couple month after that um, maybe but usually if you can see our talks they are not uh, linear uh, we are jumping from one topic to the another topic. It's it's, it's more interesting for me. Um, but I, I'm not. I do not know. Maybe maybe we'll, if I still find uh, something interesting, I will continue. But for the next year, to be honest, it will be more difficult because competition will be more higher. And maybe it's better to to, to leave this for others and try to find some new areas. Yeah, it, based on how all the different presentations that you two described earlier, it seems like you two work together really well in finding these types of things. I know some people earlier were asking, uh, how should somebody go about starting out research and picking out targets? Do you have any suggestions for people on how they can just kind of start getting into the type of research field that you two do seem to really do really well? Um, so I don't think that one is um, easy to answer. Um, so it's just like, at least for me, um, being uh, up to date with the latest research from other people in the in the community and industry, uh, or maybe reading articles uh, that are not as uh, directly related with what you do. So for example, um, I think that the JNDI injection that was the first one that we did together started out of reading um, an article about a malware analysis. And in that malware analysis, uh, the malware was using some JNDI lookups. Uh, we found that interesting. We started researching that. And that, that led to the JNDI injection attack. As part of that attack, we found some gadgets that were using setters uh, instead of like magic methods in like in Java deserialization and so on. And we found that as an entry point to the JSON deserialization attacks that we did like following year. So sometimes one thing takes you to the to the next one. Um, sometimes they are not even related, like uh, jumping from JNDI to uh, JSON deserialization or 
a martial art serialization. Uh, so sometimes uh, just like reading a lot of stuff gives you ideas. Sometimes you just are playing with something in your regular uh, work and then you find something interesting and you just pull the thread and find something else. So it's just, I mean, things are not going to come to you. You have to be actively reading, uh, looking for things, and then you will always find something that is interesting and you can pull the thread and find something more. If you just stay passive, uh, like uh, reading, but not asking yourself why things are uh, working in such or such other way, then I don't think that there is room for research. And my suggestion not to be focused on the results of the talk, um, one my career study, you, you, it's very difficult to, on the first year to, 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 to be accepted in Black Hat or DEF CON or something like that and produce such, such a results. I would suggest just to be focused on something, some area, what you like this and you have passion on that, that and follow for, 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 for new research. Try to understand each new novel technique and maybe try own thing. Maybe you have ideas and, um, be patient. Um, I, I think. I, I do not know. For me, it, it took a couple of years to, 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 to get some. If, if your new uh, stuff will start to give you results and you can start to think about how to summarize this and present to others. And just to, to start a career from Let's Talk at DEF CON, it's, for me, it's difficult to, to imagine. You need to have. Uh, uh, some background in this area and produce something new. And for this, you need year, not years, you need time. For, for somebody, it's, it's months. For somebody, it's years. But still, the, the, for me, it's main uh, target. It's, it's, it's my passion in, in that areas, uh, areas. No, no, not just talking DEF CON. DEF CON, it's results. If you have results, you can present it at DEF CON. If you do not have results, mm -hmm. let's wait. Let, let's try other, uh, other direction. But you need to like this without passion, it's, it's difficult. I love that you two said uh, really quite different things there. In one case you have, hey, I was reading an article and then I thought really deep about that article, but it seemed like it was something different from your previous research. And then the other answer would be, I just really like this stuff and I learned everything I could about it. So it's, it's nice to hear the two different two different sides, if not the two different sides, about how to approach uh, a new topic and how to find something cool in it. Which is probably why they work together so well and have had yeah. so much great research through yeah. the years. We have very different approaches for, for, for uh, everything. So it's, 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 it's like even research is different. Uh, I'm one thing and one approach, Alvaro is just completely different uh, approach. Uh, for example, I never read uh, documentation before a research. Uh, it took more time, but I have some some, some rule: do not uh, open um, documentation. Arvaro start with documentation and can uh, find something more more quickly, the, the, the significant yeah, quickly. Read the fucking uh, manual. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, TFM, right? <laughs> <laughs> yep. 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 <clears throat> So um, what did we not get to see during this presentation? I know you've already talked about when you your presentations tend to jump around a little bit, so maybe you have the opportunity to hit more content uh, or whatever you wanted to present during your, your go, but uh, due to time or due to not having it uh, fully formed in your head, what would you have liked to have put into this presentation where there more time, more ability? So th there is um, a lot of content that is not in the actual talk, in the actual video, but it's available in the white paper that we released as part of, of the talk. It's simply that we were not able to fit uh, all the content in those 40 minutes. Um, apart from that, that's uh, something that just didn't f uh, fit into the time allocated for the video. Um, I think that I would also like to have look into other languages. We just focus on .NET and, and Java. And maybe for .NET, I would also have uh, looked into other content management systems that are different from SharePoint. Maybe, I don't know. I, I'm not really very familiar with uh, the .NET ecosystems, but for example, .NET Nuke is a potential um, target that we just didn't have time to, to look into. 
agree with Alvaro. Actually, we have more fundings, and usually when, when, when you start to search something, you have more fundings, but you need to to collect them in some topic, in some scope. Of course, um, a lot of things out of scope. Maybe for the later uh, research, maybe for, for some blog post, maybe not, maybe it's not interesting, uh, something like that. It depends. If you will have like two hours talk, maybe we will include some, some new stuff for SharePoint. There was something interesting stuff because there was some playing with the roles and other thing. Um, but I think current current our white paper meets scope what 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 we draw before this white paper and TED talks and it's it's more interesting when you have a lot of stuff it's not good as well because it's very difficult to focus on on, on something even this stuff you have two parts and uh, .NET and java it's it's a bit different java has a lot of uh, template and giants uh, uh, .NET has only sharepoint it's a bit difficult to, follow, to to keep focus audience for for these two parts. I think uh, if you want to, to include something else, maybe it's better to, to have separate talk, no, 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 not in this. To build a new talk, yeah, makes sense. It's nice to uh, to be able to isolate yes, down. We always, we always keep some approach. Um, to say that in English, like um, something like seeds approach for the next talk. <laughs> Mm -hmm. Something that looks promising, um, maybe it's a, a new way into a new road that can lead you to something. So yeah, that's also something that we normally don't include in the talks. <laughs> that's or that uh, you're never going to retire from this, are you? There's always going to be something new and interesting to uh, do a talk on. It's difficult because competition from year to year, it's, it's, it's more harder and harder. There are a lot of new guys and a lot of old guys and uh, it's not easy. It depends. Let's hope that we will have motivation and time and resources for new researchers. We like this. Life will show. So um, we have about five minutes left in our scheduled time here. Is there anything that you, uh, like what's your call to action? Uh, where would you direct people to, to keep poking at this? Or what's something that as you were hunting through all of this that you were like, oh, this would be something that I want somebody to look at, but maybe I don't have the background or the time or, or what's the, what's the big gap? Yeah, there's your question out well, of the blue. Said, yeah, so as I said, uh, um, we didn't look at other languages. I, I know there is a lot of research around server-side template injection in JavaScript and Python. Uh, but yeah, so those are sandbox as well, and probably those sandbox uh, need to be bypassed. <laughs> so if... Um, a good direction for, for people like wanting to look into this area of research is looking at how these other languages implement sandboxes and maybe try to find a ways to, to break them. I agree with Alvaro. Actually, we have two different .NET and Java uh, languages. I think if we uh, found something similar in these two languages, we can assume that um, many other are affected. And it's not problem in languages, it's a problem in design. Actually, it's very difficult to, 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 to implement good sandbox uh, for these cases, I believe. It, it's, it's, it's very difficult and there are a lot of potential areas and we try to, to, to highlight the most obvious of them. And I think it's a good idea to look in any places, like, like this, in any, in any, any languages, in any uh, system, in any um, other place. That makes sense. Well, thank you for that. Um, do if you would be so kind, uh, you can toss us in probably the track one channel would be a good place for this. Any place that folks can contact you later, uh, since this is a new format, we can actually put down if there's an email address or a Twitter profile or something that uh, or a GitHub, you could post so that I in that chat. Guys, I don't know if you can hear me. I can, as a matter of fact. Oh, maybe. I can hear you. I th we might have just lost him. Oh, you're back. Yeah, I just, I'm back. <laughs> I lost all of you. 
Well, welcome back. Uh, so we were just chatting about if there is a, a you know GitHub or a Twitter profile or an email or something that you. I believe you put something like that in your talk, but can everybody hear me? Well, yep. Okay. Yeah, uh, so my personal uh, Twitter handle is uh, Pontester, obviously, and um, also I work for the GitHub Security Lab, where all the advisories for the uh, different content management systems with the details about how we were able to exploit them or break their sandboxes um, are being published. Uh, some of them have been published already. Some of them are still to be published. So you may also want to, to follow that one. Um, I think it's G H um, Security Lab. Just let me. Yep, you can uh, you could type that into the uh, Track One uh, channel at your leisure, um, and people can see that there. If there's, and that's pretty much that's the last of the questions I have. I, I want to thank you both very much for building this presentation and taking time out of your day to come and do this QA with us. Uh, this is what makes this community better than uh, anything else I've ever been a part of. So thank you very much for your efforts and uh, I hope to see more from you folks in the near future. Thank you very much thank for you. having us and hopefully, yeah, we can present again in, in DEFCON next year. And yeah, in this time in person. Definitely. Yep, next time in person. Definitely. Well, I appreciate it. Uh, have a great rest of your day. Enjoy the con. And uh, to everyone watching, um, you should be able to see here in the next little while the um, contact information show up in the Track 1 channel. Otherwise, we will see you for the next one. Bye, everyone. Have a good one. Bye-bye.